Drink beer, it's good for you. Hello and welcome to the video. This is the first part of a new series of videos where I'll be moving through a list of common mistakes made by home brewers all the way through the process from grain to glass. There are quite a few of them, but thankfully most of this just needs a brief introduction and quite a few of them can sit well together in a shorter video format that acts as a checklist. Some of the general topics around these mistakes mentioned have separate video guides already on my channel, and where appropriate I will show them on screen during the section. These are presented in no particular order and I hope you find them either helpful or reassuring. So let's get started. Let's start with doughing in properly. Doughing in is the process before you start your mash where you add your grain to your mash water. For the best results this should be added gradually and stirred in fully as you go. At the end of this process you should then stir the grain from the bottom, middle and then top. This is known as finalising the mash. By following this process you will avoid grain clumping together in what is known as dough balls, and you will also maximise the potential of your mash. Failing to do this will result in a loss of efficiency and variation in your efficiency that will make dialing in your recipes impossible. Having a correct grain crush is vital. I have a video that gives a guide to this on the channel as shown on screen. If your grain is milled too finely then this can lead to a stuck mash which will impact your efficiency and lead to further action being required. This can also lead to a stuck sparge, which has the potential to severely lengthen the process. Also if your grain is milled too coarsely then you will see a great drop in efficiency. If your grain is being crushed by your supplier of the malt then this does not mean it is necessarily correct. There is no one grain crush to suit all types of grain, brewing systems or brewing methods, so be sure to specify. Then we have bad equipment. Cheap brewing systems and other equipment can present a bargain, but sadly this is not usually the case with many simply not suitable for brewing. Temperature control and accuracy are the most common areas that they fall down on, particularly during the mashing process, not to mention poor reliability. It may well say the right temperature on the controller and it may not be fluctuating visibly, but this is because the temperature probe was designed with just the boil temperatures in mind and is very inaccurate within the mash range. These so-called brewing systems are simply repurposed tea boilers with not enough modifications to make them a viable option. This leads to unintended changes in the end beer, meaning that you end up with something that was not your recipe's design. These days you do not need to spend a fortune on a brewing system, but a decent one will have a price tag higher than super cheap. It should also be mentioned that these super cheap systems are often not safety approved, even though they carry the appropriate markings. The law is simply different across the world. I will also add that some of this cheap stuff can be found with inflated prices in some parts of the world, and this can fool some people. The saddest thing about this is that some will buy these and not understand what is wrong with their beer and will believe what they have bought is perfectly fine. I have a three-part buyer's guide series of videos that is dated 2019 that is still current if you need help with selection. When using regular yeast, temperature stability and accuracy is vital. Failure to use it can lead to off flavours in your end beer. Simply adding a fermenter into a centrally heated room is not adequate temperature control for many types of yeast, and the temperature fluctuations can lead to off flavours. The same is true of air conditioning also, in case you are wondering. There are various solutions to this out there in the homebrew market for temperature control, and there is also fake yeast that is more than happy under fluctuating temperatures in the main, so there are plenty of options here for sure. For more information about this and fermentation in general, then check out my Easy Homebrew Fermentation Guide on this channel. This covers a few things, so let's start with yeast. Brewers make wort, but yeast makes beer. Your yeast is core to the process. Always use yeast that has been stored correctly and is in date. Correct storage for liquid yeast is in the fridge, but dry yeast can be stored in a dry cool area or the fridge or freezer without modification. If your yeast is not in date then it can be recultured easily at home, but the key message here is that there is little point in using yeast that may have a compromised health. Always use yeast nutrient, it contains the all important zinc that is missing from your wort that your yeast needs for cell growth, and acts as a great insurance policy for a successful fermentation. Moving on to grain now, the storage of grain requires a cool dry place and ensure your grain is stored sealed, preferably in a vacuum and definitely away from sunlight. If your grain is already crushed then it is certainly more susceptible to moisture, light and heat than whole grains are. 
You can store grain in the fridge if you have space. When it comes to hops, you should have them vacuum sealed and stored in a freezer. When it is time to use your hops for brewing, then there is no problem in using them straight from your freezer and into a boil. But I do suggest you add them to your fridge a day or so before using them for dry hopping, otherwise they will cause a temperature shift in your fermenter that your yeast may not thank you for. Here is a very common one. Not changing a shared recipe to match the ingredients you use will simply lead to the wrong IBU and gravity. Malt from different malsters will vary in potential yield and hops have varying levels of alpha acid percentage. Within your recipe software, always enter in the relevant data of your hops and grain and adjust the recipe so that it leads to the same numbers as the original recipe. You can be sure that 9 times out of 10 this data will be very different and you will need to compensate for it. You may also need to do further adjustments if you use a different yeast. The final figure in the end to check is the BUGU ratio. I have a video that explains this recipe correcting process and also a guide to BUGU ratio on this channel to assist you. So there you have it for part 1. I hope you found this useful, look out for further parts of this series soon or perhaps they exist already depending on when you watch this. If you are interested in connecting further with me and a large community of other like-minded happy brewers, then why not join this channel's Facebook group for discussion, hints, tips and often the chance to shape my future content. This now brings this video to a close. If you have any questions, then please let me know via YouTube or Facebook. I do hope that you found this video to be useful, interesting and enjoyable. If appropriate, then please like this video on YouTube, and if you've not done so already, then please subscribe. I regularly post new content. Happy brewing!